So uh, I have some of my own housekeeping things, so we're gonna go through this. One of the reasons we're here is because of the Exola funding programs. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, I'm also gonna ask a couple questions in a few minutes, but quickly I wanna go through what Exola is doing to help developers find funding. So obviously we already talked about this. I really hate seeing my head big, so we're gonna move on quickly. <laughs> So I wanna talk about two programs that Exola has that helps developers find funding, both of which are actually no cost. We have Exola Funding Club, which is a digital matchmaking service. It's free to join, you submit an application, the games are reviewed, and if approved, it goes onto the platform. We have a ton of folks, and I'll give some more details, and we also have Exola Accelerator. We have the head of our Accelerator team somewhere in here, so track her down after the event if you're interested in learning about the Accelerator. Quickly, uh, we've had over 1,250 developers applied and approved, over 100 matches, which is about an 8% success rate, which is about 50 times the industry average for games pitched to getting signed. Uh, 200 plus current publishers and investors, they all make their own investment decisions, so to be clear, Funding Club is not a fund, it is a matchmaking service. Uh, a little bit more, it's fill out an application, accepting games are showcased, we actually have a showcase tomorrow. We're hosting a live event, six games pitch in 60 minutes in front of 30 or 40 publishers, investors, and we've had about a 50% success rate from those games actually finding funding. Uh, Exol Accelerator is a 16 week program. It basically takes games that are pretty good from that stage to being able to be ready to really pitch in front of publishers and investors. We have them practice pitching once a month for four months and then do a live event with them. They meet, match up with producers, programmers, artists, business people, whatever they need. Bridge funding of up to 100,000 and then personalized mentorship from other industry folks, not just Exola folks. Uh, Accelerator has a little bit about the program, basically it's one application, so the same funding club application will also get you into Accelerator if you're interested. Uh, it's a little bit more lengthy because our team does actually do an evaluation process and a contract is signed. And then let's get to the reason we're really here. So Lost in Play, um, we're a whole bunch to talk about. I got more questions than I probably can get through. First I wanna ask, who's in the audience? So how many of you are actually developers? Awesome, how many are investors, publishers? And how many are just here to see me make a fool of myself? <laughs> Let's see, I, all, all my friends, thank you. <laughs> It's good to have friends in low places. So we're just gonna kinda have a pretty casual talk. We're gonna talk a little bit about some of the realities of what's happening in the industry right now. Um, but first, before we do that, I think we should probably show you what we're talking about in case you don't know. So actually, I'm actually thrilled that we have, you have all here all the way from Israel, but we also have a couple of other team members here, so I would actually at least like you guys to raise your hands, please, I know, I don't wanna embarrass you, but two of the other key members of the team are here as well. Um, we're super happy to have them here. So I'm gonna start off talking a little bit about the origin. We're gonna really get into the game, but I think we always gotta do a little bit of the origin story. As an indie game fan, uh, I always like to hear about the studios, so let's talk a little bit about the origin stories of Happy Juice Games and a little bit of what led to this, which was a game that maybe some of you have heard of, maybe not, Office Quest. But let's talk about that, the origin story, and how did you guys kind of form Happy Juice as a team? Okay, so uh, all three of us, uh, Oren and Alon, which are in the uh, audience tonight, uh, today, <laughs> uh, they are in charge of the animation, and I'm also, I've been an animator before, uh, and they did the, before Office Quest, they did the, before uh, Lost in Play, they did the Office Quest, which is a mobile game, and they, de de they developed uh, along with uh, Eleven Ship. It was a mobile game, it was kind of in the style of Lost in Play, which is point and click, 
uh, but a bit simpler, more adjusted to mobile. Uh, I did some games with Oren before that, and we got a really good connection. Uh, so when they, they did they they thought about making a new game, uh, they talked to me, and like I was doing some freelance work at the time, I had a, a, a long time, I was work, I had a mobile gaming company, and did mobile games, it was really struggling, and I, I'm, I was out of it, I started doing some freelancing and actually made money. <laughs> <laughs> and then they came and I, I didn't wanna do it, but it was so convincing and I loved them so much, so, and I loved the artwork that they presented to me and the idea, and I said, okay, like that's, this is my time to pursue this, and, I'm gonna do it, so I started doing this part-time, still trying to earn money while pursuing this. Got it, so um, one of the titles obviously was the new realities of a great indie game, and I don't use that term lightly. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, there's a lot of great games. When I say a great indie game, Simon Carlos was nice enough to give us some data. The game is currently 98% on Steam with 2,200 reviews, which puts it in the top 5% of all games on Steam, so it's not just me who thinks so. Uh, we got a few awards, not, not a ton, not as many as I think it should. So we got a few awards. So let, let's talk a little bit about, I guess, the journey. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip ahead and then skip around because it's kind of fun for me. So, and, and I'm old school, I'm sorry, I'm reading off my notes because I can't remember all the questions and I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump around. So let's talk about how and when and why you decided to make this, own, this game on your own dime and your own money some of the origins of some of the conversations you had before we met up. Yeah. So why don't we talk a little bit about that? Okay, so um, like I said before, after the Office Quest, we started, uh, we wanted to make a new game. Our, like our take up from uh, the Office Quest that was that we wanted to make a game that was also fitting a controller and that had more freedom of movement, uh, that was more cinematic, that was more appealing to a wider audience. Uh, so, uh, we thought that the, the best platform for that would be some kind of a mobile platform, a subscription service of some sort, because we didn't want a game that had a lot of ads and a lot of like freemium content. But for mobile, if you want to make money, it's pretty hard to do that without a freemium uh, model. So, the subscription service was something that we tried to pursue. So, we actually pretty got, got along pretty far off with a deal with some first party <laughs> that I can disclose. Uh, but uh, after a while, COVID started and things shifted and we were really far ahead on production we, because we needed to, it had a time frame that we needed to, to do. So we really hurried up and invested or more of our own time that I initially planned. Uh, but that didn't fall through in the end. Like COVID started and things changed and the industry shifted and priorities changed. So we found ourselves uh, trying to do a new thing. So we actually opened a document called Plan B. <laughs> and to this day, that's the document we are still working with. <laughs> yeah. so, so Plan B was to actually take, like, advance with what, what we had, which, we, which was like 40 minutes of gameplay or 30 minutes, which, which was, looked kind of the, the same as, as it is now. Um, yeah, that was, that was part of it from the first level. Um, so it was kind of the same of, of what we had now. Uh, and we tried to, let's put it on social media, let's try to get some people's attention, let's try to see what people are actually saying and try to bring it to consoles and PC because again, if, if it didn't fall through with, if it didn't work with the uh, first parties on mobile, uh, there's no audience for it as a premium game on mobile. That was what we thought at the time. So we put some videos in on Reddit, we put some videos in on Twitter, and on Instagram and all that, and started getting attention, and the reception was really good. Like people are saying it looks like Gravity Falls, it looked like an animated TV show, I don't believe this is a game and not, uh, and not a, a cartoon, and that's what got your attention as well, I guess. Yeah, so I, so, as I said, so was that when you realized you might be onto something, or at least might have a, an inkling that this might be something people wanted? Yeah, like when, when we really got far ahead on our initial approach to the first part is we thought, okay, maybe we do have something because it, was, it wasn't hard for us to, to get like ahead. So, and we felt that we have something strong in, when we showed it to people, when we played tested it on people. So 
But definitely uh, talking to publishers and talking to you uh, that did that. But we also approached many other publishers ourselves and other approached us and we did felt that it was really good but like the funding that we wanted to raise didn't really work with, uh, with the genre, you know what I mean? So uh, we actually had two plans. We initially thought to release it as a short version and then as a long version, like so we had, had two had options. Plan, plan B to your plan B? We had a plan B to our plan B. Uh, so we had two options we tried to pitch to publishers, which was really confusing for them and it didn't work at all. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So quickly, so how he and I met was I actually, I think it was a screenshot Saturday? Something like that, yeah. So um, quickly, so obviously I work for the Xolos funding division. I'm constantly looking for great games that I think should submit for funding to get in front of a bunch of publishers and investors. I reached out to them because the game literally just looked like I was playing a cartoon and was a short clip. Reached out to them on Twitter, they responded, had them sign up for Funding Club, and almost immediately uh, the team at Joystick Ventures, which is one of the funds inside of Funding Club, reached out. Um, full disclosure, I also work on that team, so I had a little inside track. Um, we reached out, started having conversations, and we struck up a deal. Um, and Joystick sits somewhere between a traditional VC and a, and a publisher. We don't actually do publishing, but we don't invest in equity. So I reached out, we had some great conversations, we hit it off. Uh, they realized that we just wanted to see a great game made and kind of left them alone. Um, so that's how we met up. That's how the funding club thing ties back in. That will probably be the last you hear me really talk about Exola at this point. Um, so let's, let's talk about the funding issues, right? And I think it's always kind of the elephant in the room. You guys yeah. have put a lot of money into the game yourselves. True. Um, and some of the things that we asked you to do from a funding standpoint were also costing money, like this game is too short potentially for what we want to do with it. So tell me how you were able to decide to bridge that gap with how much you were putting in on yourselves, how much Joystick was putting in, and what ultimately made sense, because where the game, when we met where the game was, and where it ended up. So talk about those design decisions that ultimately end, ended up the game where it is now. And the design decision that relates to making the game longer. Yeah, spending more of your own time and own money, coming back to uh, Joystick, asking for more time. So let's talk a little bit about. So yeah. I'm always big on communication, and I think one of the things that is sometimes lost in translation of this, oh, publishers and investors and developers don't get along, is it's lost in the communication. And I think the thing that I want to talk about is that how was that communication, how was the decision made, how was it yeah. jointly made? Because these are some of the things that I think a lot of people don't talk about, but it's that relationship that allowed that to happen. So I, I want to hear from your perspective. So from my perspective, uh, first of all, the game is, a, is an epic journey. So an epic journey cannot be like five minutes. It has to be <laughs> <laughs> pretty long. And animation, it takes a long time to, to produce and it costs money. So we felt like we, we proceeded with the game as planned. At some point uh, in time, we just decided to make it longer. But um, I, I'm not sure like it was just like we had a certain scope we wanted to produce. Um, what we did was just we continued on our own. We tried to limit ourselves to to certain puzzles, to, to a certain scope. But like always, it always takes longer than than you think. Um, what happened was that we continued on ourselves uh, just as much as we needed, and we actually approached Joystick Ventures <laughs> post effect. That's what happened. Uh, and but they worked amazingly with us, like uh, more than, it's not like I'm trying to, you know. <laughs> Anybody knows me that I'm not up here. <laughs> yeah, for that. sure. But it was like, we have a, such a great relationship with Ivan and with you and with everybody that we actually came post the post the effect after we invested much more time in it and we said, listen, uh, we ended up investing much more than, than what we thought about uh, and then, Surprisingly, Ivan said, and fine, that, you know, we'll tell me how much you invested and we'll discuss it and try to, to see what we can do. And everything, you know, ended up great for us. So let, let's talk about approaching launch, right? Um, you guys as a team hadn't launched on a console before, really hadn't launched on Steam before. So yeah, let, that's true. Let's talk about some of the surprises you encountered as we got closer to launch. 
and then we can talk about the real surprise we got after launch. <laughs> yeah. If anybody from Steam is in the room, I'm gonna apologize in yeah. advance. We're gonna have a, <laughs> an, a mature audience only discussion for a few minutes, but <laughs> let's talk about leading up to launch and then we'll talk about launch. Okay, so leading up to launch, there was, like, there was a lot of stuff that, like Steam was fine. We did so much testing on, on PC in terms of before launch, so we knew all the bugs, most of them, like we got a big, a big uh, good rating, so most of the big ones we found uh, beforehand. Uh, but console was pretty stressing for me, to say, <laughs> to say the least, because I never launch a game on console and on Switch, and it has its own limitations, uh, and it, like, I didn't know that there's so many stuff you need to do for a lot check and, and, and a lot of stuff, so it was stressing. So we, what we, I worked like really, really hard before launch, and we hired a firm that, that, that did, uh, what, what's it called? Uh, that they, they checked your lot check before submission. I can't yeah, remember so it was the a name. QA, it was a QA team, but they yeah, specialized it, in Switch. Yeah, so uh, that kind of got me relaxed more <laughs> because we could actually, like, they went over all the little details, and we, it was also a very tight schedule. Uh, we had, like, uh, time that we needed to submit before release, which was really critical because we wanted to release both uh, platforms at the same time. Uh, so uh, they found what they needed to find, and we fixed that. Um, yeah, it, but it, it, again, it was a stressful time just to work so much. It was like two or three months that I just uh, worked too hard and <laughs> didn't, didn't get home. I didn't see my kids. <laughs> so, so we had the yeah. self-imposed crunch. <laughs> yeah, self-imposed crunch. Uh, but in the end, it turned out good in terms of uh, we did manage to release on time and without major issues. Yeah. So, uh, so what was your, I guess what was the single biggest surprise when dealing with Nintendo? Because the first time, I mean, what, what was what was the was there one thing? I mean, I know you talked about the lot check and everything, but was it the, the length of time it took to get everything done? I mean, what was it that? Uh, I, well, the problem is not the problem, but the issue is like it's essentially it's a mobile device, and it has its limitations. But uh, I, we knew that coming in. But there's like all sorts of of, uh, of uh, stuff that you cannot do there. But I don't think I can talk about it because of NDAs with the Nintendo. <laughs> I'm not sure what. So find what us we can afterwards. <laughs> yeah, talk to me outside. I'll let you know. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to get into the fun, right? So we just talked about launch tech. Um, before we get into the the good, bad, and the ugly, let's talk about launch surprises. Okay. We we came to launch day, <laughs> relatively oh, relatively okay. We yeah. go to launch day. So what were some, you in the studio? What were some of your biggest surprises? So okay. What like what were you nervous well, about? What were you excited about? What so and we'll talk about what happened afterwards that really caused all the stress. But let's talk about some of the stuff that in general. In general, like before launch? Well, or, yes, it's uh, leading up right to launch. But and you know what the biggest surprise on launch was? <laughs> that we actually launched the game <laughs> and uh, there was no buy button for <laughs> Steam. It was a huge surprise. We, like we sat in the office, we poured us drinks, so we <laughs> sat and waited on the, on the clock to come. We were already a bit wasted and there was no buy button. So yeah, that wasn't good. <laughs> so I. <laughs> <laughs> so I will say this is definitely for mature audiences, and then we can say MA. <laughs> there was a couple really big fuck-ups that happened the, uh, the last minute. So one was no buy button, and it was about six to eight hours, I believe. Something like that, And yeah. Now, granted, Joystick's a small company, and there's, we didn't spend a ridiculous amount of money on marketing and stuff at launch. But there was definitely some. There was some marketing, some advertising, some promotions. And imagine you have a bunch of people coming to Steam, and all of a sudden they can't buy your game and there's really no recourse for about six hours. Now, this is not meant to be a Steam bashing session at all. They did some great stuff, they fixed it really quickly, but as you can imagine, as a small indie studio and a very small funding source, the, the stress and aggravation of that first six hours and getting them to actually turn on the buy button. Yeah. Um, we'll get to the other screw up in a minute. So let's talk about the surprises, which was making it on to, make it on to the top of the second one, number two on the charts or number three, depending on what chart we were on. Yeah. Um, no, we were on the, on the popular upcoming chart, but that's all games that has a certain amount of wish lists in terms of, uh, I think over 10,000 wish lists or so, uh, get to the top and, and like, uh, like in the order of their release. So we were up there. 
which was good. Like most wish lists that we got prior to launch was from the future game show that we got on, which was a big surprise, a good surprise early on because it's a pretty big show and shows a lot of major titles. Um, yeah, so let's keep going on that real quick. So I probably skipped over some, some of the pre-launch things we did to try to build awareness. And again, and this is where I think it'll resonate for most of these, was not spending a lot of money. It was more PR activities. It was more personal outreach. So we talked about future. Let's talk about some of the other shows that you, you thought were, were effective times for putting out trailers and some of the other things. Before release? Yeah, before release. Uh, yeah, we wore the Wholesome Games, which was really good. We wore the Shack News, which was awesome. We wore a, a lot of small, uh, smaller and bigger shows like that. I can't remember all of them. The Indie X show, uh, we like, um, we were like, like the dev, uh, dev the devs, like there's one up there, uh, which was really awesome. We were on, like, we were on a lot of shows like that. Um, but wishlist wise, Future Game Show was like here, and all the rest was. Uh, a lot lower. The, the Steam Next uh, Fest was really, really good for us as well. That's when we showed that the demo and we got like the, the first reaction from a, a bigger crowd because uh, before that we just did some internal testing. Um, so, yeah. All right. So, despite the problems at the initial launch, it made it on to the top charts for a little while. Yeah. We didn't discover it until, I want, I want to say, the next day. We realized one of the other things. So not only do we have the one strike, we had the second strike. Steam didn't send out to the wish list. So the 30 plus thousand or 40,000 40, people. Over 40,000, 50,000. Nobody got notified the game was on sale. So we had. It, it was released. Nothing said yeah, that. Yeah, well, it was released <laughs> and then it was out. So yeah. imagine, imagine our surprise 24 hours after launch, after the panic of not having a buy button, now realizing that everybody who said they were interested in the game, nobody ever found out. And again, Steam did fix it fairly quickly. Um, I'm not gonna publicly say about how many sales I've estimated that cost us and how much money it cost the team, but it was not insignificant. They've come back and offered some make good. So there was a couple pretty big obstacles. Let's talk a little bit about disaster recovery. Let's talk a little bit about some of the surprises post-launch after the negatives. So, yeah. I mean, and again, we have a lot to talk about. So I want to talk about some of the things that surprised you, marketing-wise, and some of the things that you guys did. And, and I think one of the biggest surprises was how much work was after launch, right? It's a single-player, story-driven, four- to six-hour experience. Yeah. What was it like after launch for a studio, though, even with a relatively bug-free game? Let's talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, first of all, there's the after, after launch and after the, <laughs> the fuck-up with, with the uh, wish list. Uh, not being sent, which was terrible. Uh, like, and again, the, like we, the, we didn't like the, the peak that we thought was going to be at the beginning wasn't that high because I think because of all that we, you cannot know in hindsight. Maybe, maybe it didn't make uh, that much of a difference, but you never know. Uh, but uh, yeah, after that, like you, you, we basically went into shock because there was like this anticlimax uh, and. Uh, and you start refreshing the button all the time, and <laughs> you do that for, <laughs> for a few days. Uh, yeah, and then it, there's, there's a lot of like react, reacting to people, look, look, looking at reviews, um, bug, bug fixes and patches, even though it's, it's a small, there wasn't that, much, that many of them. Uh, we still needed to, to do some of that. We had like a, a big bug with a save system, like people needed to play like five minutes again sometimes a certain point, which was the most major bug we had, but uh, we fixed that relatively quickly. But also, like, I think the main thing is about after such a long time of being like in a stress, uh, in a stress, stressful work, and, uh, and all the excitement leading up to launch, it was just about, you know, recovering ourselves. That was the main thing for me, at least. So let, let's talk a second or two about that. And we don't have a lot of time, and I'm hoping there's a few questions out there, um, and I want to get to them. So let's talk about the need for that personal recovery for at least a short period of time, even after all the stress of the launch and fixing a few bugs. Yeah. What was that like? How did you manage that with everything going on? And how long did you kind of take to go, OK, I care about this again? No, I cared about it instantly, well, I did, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> but. Uh, I know. I think it's like, it for me it was like f three months 
or so until I, I, I could normal. actually <laughs> felt normal again. Yeah, like we started working pretty fast on the, on the next thing, uh, but just in terms of ideas, but actually doing actual work and not just like worrying about the game, com com communicating with people, checking sales uh, and all that, I think, yeah, it took, it took me a while. So let's so talk about checking sales. We had a couple surprises. Um, do you wanna talk about the market surprises yeah. a little bit? So, yeah. so, so, so what was so, the surprise on the market side? So in the market side, I think the biggest surprise was the Chinese market on Steam, which was something that we didn't take into consideration, but it's, it's huge. I think it's the biggest market right now. I'm not sure about everybody, but for us, it's been like take a, a fairly big percentage of the, of the sales we're doing, which is awesome. And that's something that we didn't even think about. And on Nintendo, like there's a really big audience in Brazil that we didn't think about that binary game. So these are two, two markets that we didn't real, even think about, which are great. Uh, so combined with the US market and the European market, even the Russian market is bigger than we thought for us, at least. Uh, Before the fun, but we'll, <laughs> that's another <laughs> talk. <Yeah. laughs> All right, so we don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna quickly, let's get into the discount strategy. Like yeah. how, we talk about how to survive, how to keep the game going. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that, because we've had some heated debates about the discount strategy. How much, how often, when, where, where do we go? Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what, we, what, we, what you've so, done and what we decided on. So yeah, so the game, because like it launched pretty, like not as much, as big as we thought, um, yeah, there's also the debate if, if you wanna like do a big discount early on or you wanna wait and not burn out your, your sales beforehand. Um, but because we had like a, a small launch, a, a slow launch, we decided to go on a pretty aggressive uh, sales strategy. Not that aggressive, but after a few months we already went to 40%. Uh, but it worked out really well for us. Like we got a lot of sales from that and the reviews are great. And, it, and like most games, you look at, at SteamDB and other resources, you see there's this, uh, this uh, hockey ball chart, whatever they call hockey it. Stick. Hockey <laughs> stick. Yeah, hockey stick chart. And for us, it wasn't like that. Like that was the scary part for us because we thought if that's the high point, where, where's the low point? Where, what's our baseline? Uh, but our baseline was pretty close to what we sold on release, a bit lower, but not, not like, very significant, and each sales we did, because we did have like the, the wish list they accumulated and they, they didn't got wasted on, on, on the day one, because so we had a big wish list uh, as, as time went by, and the uh, sales worked really well, because like the, our price point is $20 uh, for a relatively short game, like it's five hour long or something like that, so people, reacted really well to sales and we could still make money off sales because we priced it okay. We didn't go uh, very low to start with. Got it, so um, unfortunately there's out of time. There's a whole bunch of other questions. Anybody in the audience have any quick questions they wanna get to before we have to bail? I am, I was told we have a few extra minutes before Sally comes up here and starts beating me with a stick. So please did go ahead and stand up. And <laughs> Hi. Thank you, Justin and Juval. Your game is gorgeous, by the way. So Thank I you. believe that many developers have a similar problem that you described of the chicken and an egg. In order to get funding, the game has to look beautiful and fun, but in order for that, well, you need some funding in order to really polish it. So based on your experience, your positive experience that you have described, have you noticed that there are some key strategies or tactics in order to break out of these cycles? Well, in terms of that, like for us, out has been a selling point. Also, because of the talent we have in our team, like all three of us have a background in animation, and Owen and Alon are so talented and worked on broadcast TV animations. Uh, so th that was our selling point. But I think that if you have like a really good frame or a small animation, if you work on something that is fine enough, but you know that you can like produce a game at that level, so uh, it's worth everything. Like it's, uh, you know, it's, very important for sales for us at least. I agree. And how brief is enough? 
How, how much is enough? How brief is enough? How small can it be? How small can it be? high quality. I'll, I'll, oh, I, high. I'll take that just because I yeah. see the audience. So <laughs> I will tell you, I'd rather have five minutes of good than 30 minutes of mediocre, right. right? So when you're pitching something, remember most of these people, we talked to the guys at Raw Fury, the gals at Raw Fury, 13 or 1400 pitches last year, they signed two games. You can imagine how much time they're really gonna dedicate to any game. Five minutes of a really good gameplay. And by the way, if it's early, it's fine. Give me visual target samples of what it's going to look like when it's done. If you don't have the time and money to, to art up the entire five minutes, make it fun before you worry about the art. But if your game's an art game, make the art the selling point. And that's what attracted the game. I mean, literally the first time I saw it, I'm like, is this a Cartoon Network show? I didn't think about it as a game. And obviously, it worked for this type of game. Other games, it doesn't work for. So whatever genre your game is, whatever folk, you just you need to find a way to stand out. And the other thing is, all of us, nobody wants to admit it, but all of us publishers and investors, we're gamblers, but we're also risk averse. We don't want to be the first ones in the pool. We want to know you have fans. We want to know other people are interested. It's, so if I invest in a game and 50 other people are interested and it fails, then the other, all of us were wrong. If I invest in a game and nobody else was interested, I'm wrong. So that, that, that sounds really corporate and really bad, but anybody who doesn't admit that's as a publisher or investor is probably not telling you the truth. Right, we, we, nobody wants to get left holding the bag. Thank you so much, both of you. So Sally, do I have time for one more? Yes. Anybody else? Please, first hand up. <laughs> hey, uh, curious, has anybody like approached y'all with any type of like licensing or anything for your characters? Like are there any other like alternate streams of revenue you could make on it? Uh, just curious about that. Uh, well, we had a couple of conversations, but none of them really like proceeded to the next level in terms of like developing it, as you, you talk about like as a separate IP, like bringing it to TV shows or bringing it to other, yeah, mediums like that. So we had some conversation, but none of that really went to, to the next level. So I will say it's part of, a, part of a bigger strategy needs to be more of an IP strategy. We have plans as the game grows and gets bigger to do some more stuff with it. This is part of the long tail plan, and, and I always say this and a lot of people, Sometimes you just have to survive long enough to get lucky, right? Stuff, bad stuff happens, good stuff happens. We had a huge, couple huge issues at the beginning. Managed to survive, managed to have money start coming in. And by the way, none of us are retiring off of what's been made on the game. But that starts coming in and you just survive long enough to get lucky. You start getting attention, you start getting calls from people at Netflix or something, and you just have to keep going. You know? And I think that's actually true in any business. Anybody starting a business, and I hate the whole, it's not how many times you fall down. No, it's just about, living long enough and surviving long enough to finally get lucky. And I think if you follow that, very few of you are gonna be successful the first time out. I hope you are. And if you've already been successful, fantastic. I wanna meet you and shake your hand. I, I think it's, it's a process. It's building the studio, building the pipeline, building the team, building the art, taking everything you've learned and being better and then making the next thing. Um, we're out of time, unfortunately. I'm gonna stick around, and I think you all can stick around. Yeah. If anybody wants to talk to us, ask us questions, sign autographs, whatever, not for me, for them. <laughs> uh, we're gonna go outside and be there. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming.